Starting a business isn't always about bringing something new to the market. Often, it can be innovating or improving upon something that already exists. Well, Richard Lefley, CEO of MicroInsure, saw an opportunity to improve on a product that already existed in the world, but now turned it into a great success. MicroInsure seeks to prevent the poor and middle class from falling back into poverty as a result of unexpected circumstances. Through innovative partnerships and planning, MicroInsure now serves over 4 million people in 13 markets across Africa, Asia, and the Caribbean, 80% of whom have never been insured before. Richard, welcome to Success. Great to have you here. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. So, Richard, start off by uh, sharing the story of how MicroInsure came about, because I'm sure there are many listeners out there who aren't familiar with the concept of microinsurance to begin with. Sure. So back in 2002, uh, I was working in the city of London uh, in the kind of financial sector, and I became fascinated by why it was that people in in Africa especially didn't buy insurance. So I I could see the statistics. I could see that in uh, in our countries, in the US and the UK, that about 9% of GDP was spent on on insurance premiums. But I could see that in Africa, less than uh, 1% of, of GDP was spent uh, on insurance premiums. And so I became very interested in, in why this was, because in my mind, in my experience, um, from having been uh, brought up as a child in, in Africa and the Middle East, I had seen the risks that the, the average man or woman in, in those places faced. You know, they, they face a, a huge amount of risk in their lives. And so I, I took a, a voluntary uh, service position, like a Peace Corps type uh, role for a, for a couple of weeks uh, and, and went to Zambia in Africa. Uh, and I found myself living with this family um, in rural Zambia, and, and they had virtually nothing. I mean, they had um, very few clothes, and they had no shoes. Uh, they lived in a mud hut and slept on the floor. And, and, I, and I spent a couple of weeks living with this family uh, and getting to know them very, very well. And, and it kind of emerged over the course of this two-week period that they had actually kind of started off their life as a family living in the village, and then they had actually ended up in the capital city with quite a lot, with a, with a nice apartment, with a car, uh, and then they had ended up back in the village. And I was fascinated about why this was. And um, in the middle of this conversation, the, the kind of grandmother, who was a rather scary uh, lady, went off to the mud hut and came back out with her prized possession, which was um, a rather battered-looking uh, shoots and ladders board. And she explained to me that she was just trying to work her way out of poverty and that she was uh, working her way back to getting back to the city and having that apartment and that car. Uh, and that from time to time, people would come along and help her uh, accelerate her, her income by giving her a loan or giving her assistance. But she complained to me and she said, look, you know, where, where are these guys when, when things go bad, when, when I hit one of the shoots and, and, you know, things like a death in the family, uh, the kids get sick, uh, a natural disaster, all of these things that happened to this family and they caused them to slip back into poverty. Um, and so it, it kind of this light bulb went off in my head and I said, wow, you know, we have this product in, a, in our country called insurance. It's, it's extremely boring. It's, it's pretty dull product, but it works, right? And it, it doesn't stop the bad thing happening to you, but it pays out. It, it gives you money and it acts like a safety net so that when bad things do happen, you don't slip back down into poverty. And that was really the start of MicroInsure. Hmm. Now, I know that uh, building up MicroInsure has been quite the uphill battle for you. You had to battle a steep mistrust because of bad practices of previous insurancers to the people that MicroInsure is now helping. So as trust is the key to any business success, talk about how you push through the distrust to find success and what other entrepreneurs can learn from your experience to build trust for their own efforts. Sure. I mean, we spent time talking to to the clients that we wanted to work with and asked them who they trusted. Um, and you're right. I mean, insurance companies were way, way down there at the bottom of the list um, next to, to kind of criminals. The organizations that they trusted were organizations like their mobile phone company or organizations like the church. So what we did was we, uh, we we realized that we had to partner up with these organizations. We had to partner with organizations to distribute our product and to use their brand. Um, but it was also important to um, come up with very simple products. So most recently, we launched a product in Pakistan, 
And this is a product which has, uh, it's a life insurance, but it has absolutely no exclusions. So you can die from any cause. Um, you know, uh, normally a life insurance policy has loads of exclusions and reasons why the, the insurance company won't pay you. You know, if you die from a, a pre-existing illness or if you die from a war or civil war or, or perhaps from terrorism, um, those things are normally excluded on all the policies that you and me have. But we were able to launch a product which had no exclusions. Um, it also had no age restrictions. So you could be 150 years old and, and take this policy and we would pay if you died. So very, very simple products um, because poor people, especially uh, you know, illiterate people, really are not going to understand uh, why you're not going to pay their claim. And secondly, I think um, it's very important to, to provide good service. So um, low-income, middle-income families are very, very uh, price elastic. So they're willing to pay slightly more money for a product which actually works properly. And so we, we realized that we had to pay claims quickly. In fact, we pay claims within 72 hours, uh, which we can't, I can't get my insurance company in the UK to pay me in a few days. They take weeks or months. Um, so, so building up trust by, by, by being seen in the community to, to stand by your product and to, and to offer uh, a good level of service. Fantastic. So simplicity, delivering great service, being expedient. So as you mentioned, insurance can be kind of a boring and blah product all into itself. So let's put a face and a heart to this story. Since there've been so many people who have benefited from what you and your company do, share an inspiring story with this where you've been able to make a big difference in somebody's life because they had microinsure. Sure. There are so many stories that I could share with you, but I think um, there, there are one or two that really stick in my mind. And one of the early ones was I found myself in this slum in in uh, in Bangladesh, and um, there was a small uh, hut with about twelve people living in it. I mean, to this day, I have no idea how they slept at night because there's no way they could all have laid down uh, in the space of of the footprint of the hut. And this lovely lady uh, was telling me uh, about how you know last year one of her children had got sick, and she'd taken the child to the to the local hospital, and she'd waited for the doctor to come. Um, but no doctor came and there were no drugs. So the child was getting sicker and sicker. And um, the lady decided that she couldn't kind of watch her child just die. So she took the child to a, um, a kind of mission clinic. And the mission clinic was willing to treat the girl, but she, they wanted $3 to admit the child and to treat the child. And she didn't have the money. So she went home to the shack and she started to sell kind of everything she had. And she raised enough money. She went back to the hospital and her child had died. And I sat there in this slum in, in Bangladesh uh, and just, you know, tears rolling down my face and, uh, you know, trying to console this woman. I've heard stories like that in my life time and time again, but it was one of those kind of situations where it just hit a raw nerve. And I just found myself in a position where I thought, I can't allow this to happen. I can't allow this to continue. And, and I made a promise to that lady that we would find a way of bringing uh, health insurance to the mass market. And, you know, really proud. I went back there um, about uh, a year ago and was able to, to kind of introduce her to a health insurance policy that costs just a few dollars a year for a family. And, and for the first time, kind of enroll people onto, onto health insurance so that when they get sick, they can take their children to the hospital and get treated. And, and so for me, I mean, I think that the stories of meeting with the clients are incredibly powerful. They are dangerous because they do force you to think, can I stand by or do I have to come up with a solution for this problem? Hmm. Incredible. So now, Richard, you know, what, what you're doing with MicroInsure is, is extremely innovative, particularly for the industry that it is a part of. So share some ideas for the entrepreneurs that are listening about how to think about their own industry in an innovative way. Sure. The key thing is to look for the gaps, you know, first off. So I think you want to look at the industry that you're in or look at an industry that you, you think you know and really ask yourself, kind of keep asking why. I mean, those, are, those people that have children will know what I mean, but children have this ability to keep asking why, why, why. And I think that's the kind of mind frame, mindset you have to take is one of, of asking why, why do people do it this way? And then I think um, once you've seen those gaps and what's missing – I think um, you have to be really, really brutal with yourself. And I think this is where we made a mistake. We weren't brutal enough with ourselves about the, the kind of financial model. So when we started out, it was really evident to us what was missing. And I think it was fairly evident what we could do to, to fill that gap. But we weren't very honest with ourselves about whether or not that was a sustainable activity. Was that really going to generate profit? 
And so we learned a lot, I think, about partnerships and about how to create business cases. And I think once you've identified where there is a gap, then create a business case and, and, and be really clear with yourself about what it is that you need to see. So how many policies are you going to need to sell? Uh, what, what are the key variables uh, or the key kind of drivers to success to make that thing work? And then I think finally, I think the most important thing is to build a team around you. And if, you, if you're an entrepreneur, I think the, the only bit of advice I would give is try not to hire people that you like. Um, that sounds like a crazy thing to say, but actually what I mean by it is that don't hire people that are like you. The mistake I made, I hired a bunch of people who I really enjoyed uh, working with, but we all had the same skill sets. And actually, I think when you're doing one of these startups, you need to hire people that have complementary skills to the ones you have and that can assist you. And, and you need different, you need a whole range of skills to get a business off the ground, not just the skills that you have. Richard, there's so many great pieces of advice in the commentary you just made there. So I appreciate you sharing that with us. And so I've got uh, one last question for you today, Richard, is, as we discussed, bringing your game-changing idea to fruition has been an uphill battle on the best of days. So give us the best advice to business owners that you've got about fighting their own uphill battles in bringing their game-changing idea to life. What should they keep in mind always that will help them make that upward trek toward success? So I don't have a silver bullet, and I'm afraid the advice I'm going to give may not encourage many, but I don't read very many books. I, I read Jim Collins's Good to Great, and I loved it. And uh, there's an image in that book of turning up to work and being consistent in pushing on a giant flywheel. So Jim Collins talks about you know, coming to work and there being this enormous, great kind of flywheel in your office. And the first day you push on it and not very much happens. It doesn't really move. And you come back the next day and you're a bit discouraged and you keep pushing on it. And, you know, you push on it for weeks and then weeks turn to months and months turn to years. And, and perhaps, you know, if you're lucky, the thing starts to turn visibly so that when you come in the morning, it actually looks slightly different than it did yesterday. But it takes a long time for that to happen. And then before you know it, you just keep pushing and you keep pushing in the same direction and you're intentional about continuing to go after the same thing. And before you know it, this thing's whipping around. And I think that's kind of where microinsure is today, you know, and, and it's whipping around and it starts to suck in partnerships. And before you know it, you're not doing cold calls anymore. People are coming to find you. And I think, you know, my experience of starting up microinsure has been very simply one of not giving up, of just believing in something, of being willing to realize when you're heading in the wrong direction. But, you know, over the course of the last kind of 10 years, my job has just been to show up every day and to push in the same direction and to know when to make subtle, small changes in order for it to fine tune the model. But ultimately, uh, what I've been about for the last 10 years has been about, you know, selling insurance to poor people in Africa and Asia. Nothing's changed about that. And before you know it, the thing's going to be spinning around really, really fast. But you do need to be intentional about uh, keeping pushing in the same direction. A great definition of the compound effect, Richard. So I appreciate that very much. So Mr. Richard Lefley, it was a great pleasure having you talk with us here at Success, and we very much appreciate the great game-changing work that you are doing in the world. Thank you so much for being with us here today, Richard. Thank you for having me. Success Magazine Audio, copyright Success Media, all rights reserved.